I'm the children are dismissed for Children's Church, those in preschool through kindergarten. And as they're going, I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles once again to Jeremiah chapter 36. And as we come to the word, let us do so once again in prayer. Father, we hear uh, the music. And Father, the music um, brings words into our mind. The love of God, how measureless and strong. It will forevermore endure. Father, we thank you that the reservoir of your love never runs dry. It is never fully tapped. It is never uh, absent. And Father, we just are blessed by that reminder. Father, we would ask that each one of us would be filled with the knowledge of your love and be blessed by the reality of your love and that we would respond to your love shown first and foremost on the cross of Calvary and in the Savior who took our place and died our death that we might live. Father, we ask that you would speak to us from your word. Father, may we respond to it as moved by your Holy Spirit. And Father, may we give you praise for it as we see within its pages your love, your care, and your call to obedience. Father, this is our prayer. Guide us to that end, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Never say never. The phrase is a cautionary word to keep us from saying that we'll never do this or never do that. Because as you know, people are prone to change their minds. Back in 1998, I, was, I performed the wedding of a cousin from up in Minnesota. And as I was doing his wedding, I was reminded of a time back in when he was eight or nine years old. And he was adamant that he would never get married. And so firm was his conviction that at the ripe age of, again, eight or nine, he had written out on a piece of paper, I will never get married. And he dated it and he signed it. And so, when he turned 37... I had the opportunity to do his wedding, and that piece of paper showed up. <laughs> never say never. I was curious about the origin of that phrase. When, when was it first spoken or written? And there, I looked on the internet, you can Google anything, and, and I, I found that uh, it was suggested that Charles Dickens had coined the phrase in his book, The Pickwick Papers. Although looking further onto the internet, it was discovered as well that, though attributed to Charles Dickens, no one who ever read the Pickwick Papers in their entirety could find where he had actually written that in that book. And, and so here's the thing. We will never know who said never say never, right? Well, I'm not so curious about who actually said it for the first time. But, but I, I, I would like to know, out of curiosity, have any of you ever said, I'll never do this or that? Yeah, we, we've probably all said that in some aspect. I'll never eat sushi. Or kimchi. Or haggis. I'll never... Marry a farmer. Huh? Anybody ever say that? I'll never cheer for Duke. Yeah, I won't. I'm, I, I'm saying never. How about this one? I know this is true for some of you. Some of you have said, I'll never drive a minivan. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe some of you said, I'll never buy a red tractor. Maybe some, yeah, I hear that, yeah. <laughs> Maybe some of you have said, 
I'll never darken the door of a church. I've had people come through these doors and people have said, I never thought they would darken the door of a church. Maybe you've changed your mind about some things and that's okay. About other things, maybe you haven't or won't change your mind. In the Old Testament, we encounter a guy, a king of Israel, no less, who took an I'll never stance and held firm to his position to the very end. That king was the one that Andrew introduced us to earlier, King Jehoiakim. His position was that he took, the stand that he took, was one of opposition to the God of Israel and his refusal to obey God's word, which is given to him through the prophet Jeremiah. He said, I will never listen. I will never obey. From that position and to the detriment of himself, and to the detriment of his nation, he did not budge to his dying day. If only about that, he had changed his mind. But his word, when it came to God's word, in obedience to what God had said, was a solid and a firm, I'll never. Which takes us here. Many people like King Jehoiakim have positioned themselves in opposition to God and have refused to obey his word, again, to the detriment not only of themselves, but to the detriment of people in their network of relationships. In Jeremiah chapter 36, we, we hear God speaking to his people through his word via his prophet, Jeremiah. And here we can look at obedience to God and his word from three different vantage points here in Jeremiah chapter 36. And we want to do that this morning. As we think of our subject of the sermon series, Obedience, and we hear maybe not those words, but we certainly see actions that support those words. I'll never obey God. Well, let's take a look this morning. We want to look at, again, three vantage points from which to view obedience to God contained here in this chapter of Scripture. The, the, the first thing we notice is, is this. We, we have two models of obedience to God's word. There were two that are mentioned that were of the I will model. Those being Jeremiah, the prophet, and King Josiah, who was King Jehoiakim's father. Jeremiah 36 opens with these words. In, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Take a scroll and write on it all the words I have spoken to you against Israel and Judah and all the nations. From the day I spoke to you, when I first started speaking to you, from the days of Josiah until today. Jeremiah, a prophet. God had called him to prophetic ministry during the reign of King Josiah. And his ministry spanned the reigns of five kings and lasted into the exile, Israel's exile, into Babylonian captivity. A, a span of some 50 years, he spoke the word of God. To Israel. 50 years of hearing from God. 50 years of being God's spokesman. 50 years of being ridiculed for what in essence was Jeremiah's two point sermon that he repeated over and over and over again. And that two point sermon that he gave over those 50 years was basically violence and judgment. 
Violence is coming because of your sin. God's judgment is coming because of your sin. And over and over for 50 years, he proclaimed that message. So f to the point that everybody in town knew what he was going to say before he knew it, or before he said it. And they started to mock him, we're told in Jeremiah chapter 20. Oh, there comes Mr. Terror on every side, terror on every side. He was ridiculed mercifully, mercilessly. He had to hide for his life on occasion, and he was imprisoned on occasion. And his 50-year ministry met with rejection. And still, when God called him to write down everything that God had given him to say over the course of those ministries, from the days of King Josiah to the present day, he said, write it all down. So it can be spoken one more time in the, reading, in the hearing of the people. Jeremiah did it. He said, okay. Whatever you say, whatever you ask, I'll do. And so we have that model of obedience, the prophet himself, Jeremiah. But we also have reference here to, although he was dead at this time, King Josiah. Josiah, he became king when he was eight years old, according to 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verse 1. Eight years old, he became king. We just had a king in England, right? He became king for the first time. How old is he? 73? He had to wait a long time. Not Josiah. At eight years of age, the crown was placed on his head, and he was omnipotent, all-powerful, the most powerful person. Person. You can't even say the most powerful man. The most powerful person in the nation. Uh, of Josiah, it's written, again in 2 Chronicles chapter 34. He did right in the eyes of the Lord. And walked in the way of, his, of David, his father. And he did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. He did what God asked him to do. For in the eighth year of his reign, he'd been on the throne eight years. So he became king at eight, age eight, when he was 16 years of age. Now we mark 16 years of age with what? Driver's license. He marked his 16th birthday in a different way. For in the eighth year of his reign, when he was 16 years of age, while he was still a boy, he began to seek the God of David, his father. He went to David's way of living and way of responding to God. See, his father, King Josiah's father, Amnon, he didn't do that. His grandfather, Manasseh, was the most violent, vile king Israel had ever known. But when he was 16 years of age, in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet a boy, he began to seek the God of David, his father. And in his 12th year on the throne, when he was 20 years old, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, of the ashram, and the carved and metal images. He was going to kick out all of the idols of the nation. He was going to purge the nation that it may once again be a place where the true and living God, the God of Israel, would be worshipped and worshipped alone. When he was 26 years old, in the 18th year of his reign, Josiah began to repair the temple, which had been desecrated by his grandfather Manasseh and by his father Ammon. And in the course of repairing the temple so it could be once again used as a place of worship for Yahweh, there had been idols, there had been images of Moloch and, and Chemosh and, and other false gods set up in the temple in Jerusalem. It had been desecrated. So he goes about of reconsecrating the temple. And so he's bringing what was in ill repair into good repair. And so they're working, 
and in the course of repairing the temple so that it could be used, the book of the law, the writings of Moses were found. They had been set aside, cast aside for generations. And the book of the law was found and the book was brought to King Josiah. And the book was read to King Josiah. And we're told, when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. An act of repentance and sorrow. And when the, the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes saying, Great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. And what ensued, again, when Josiah is 26 years old, the king himself read the book of Moses, the writings of Moses, and then he took the writings of Moses and he gathered all the nation and he read to them, the king, reading to his subjects. He said, this is important to me. This is important to you. And the king read the book of the law to the people. And the king led in renewing the covenant with their God. For the first time in several generations, the Passover was celebrated. The Passover reminding them of the salvation which they had received from God's hand. And deliverance from Egypt. And they were reminded of God's love for them. The love of God, how rich and free, how merciful and strong. In the celebration of the Passover, the people were reminded of that which God had done for them. And of his love for them. And of God's faithfulness and commitment to them. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah... King of Judah, this scroll came to Jeremiah from the Lord for this word. Take a scroll and write, it on all, write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel and Judah and all the nations from the day I spoke to you, from the days of Josiah until today. Two verses, two models of obedience, a prophet and a king. To know their stories, I trust, is to be encouraged in our own walk with Christ, in our own love for Christ, in our obedience to Christ, in our trust in Christ. Wherever that journey may lead, oh, may we walk in the footsteps of Jeremiah and Jos Josiah, that whatever the journey brings, we will walk in faithfulness to our God and to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, who in your network of relationships have been those models for you? Who have you looked at and you've seen their faithfulness, their obedience to God over the course of long years through all types of circumstances? Oh, may we thank God for them, for the example that they have given to us and been to us and the challenge for us that their lives have presented. So who's been models for you, but, but who are you being a model of obedience for? Oh, may God grant us his power that we might remain faithful to the end for the benefit of others and for our own blessing. So that it could be said of us, may all who come behind us find us faithful, just as Jeremiah and Josiah had been found faithful to the Lord and obedient to him. So, in Jeremiah 36, we have two models of obedience to God's word, jo Josiah and Jeremiah. But we also, from a different vantage point, we see obedience in this way. We see an opportunity for obedience to God's word. So, God commands Jeremiah to write down everything God has told him to say over the period of some 23 years to that point. Write it all down. All of Jeremiah's words from God, spoken to the people, had been done orally, verbally. Now he says, now I want you to write down everything I said. That, I was thinking of that exercise, that which God had called uh, Jeremiah to do. And I thought back to a class I took in seminary on worship. 
And one of the assignments that I had for that class was to transcribe verbatim every syllable spoken during a worship service, except for the sermon, praise God. You didn't have to do that. But every word, so I got a cassette of the, you know, that's a little plastic thing, it has a little tape in it and it goes around. I got a cassette of the sermon, or the service, and I sat there at my desk, hitting the button, stopping it, writing down, hitting, stop. You know, I looked back, and even at the time I thought, what's the point? I can today, at this moment, tell you everything which was said at North Suburban Evangelical Free Church on September 23rd, 1990. It's all right here. I got an A minus on it. Yeah. But what's the point? Looking back on that assignment from 32 years, I, I find myself asking why. Was it really necessary to transcribe an entire worship service simply to share some observations about it? What was the point? So God says to Jeremiah, write down everything. Not which was said in the course of a one-hour worship service on a single Sunday. But everything I have told you to say over the span of 23 years to that point. And again, this was pre-computer. This was pre-electric typewriter. This was pre-manual typewriter. This was pre-ballpoint pen. This was pre-number two lead pencil. This was pre-paper as we know it. But when commanded to write it all down, Jeremiah didn't argue or groan, or roll his eyes, he obeyed. Maybe Jeremiah was asking himself as well, well, what's the point? You want me to do what? God, may I ask why? Well, God had a reason. This wasn't a pointless exercise that God was asking Jeremiah to do. God had his ways, he had his means, he had his reason. And his reason is this. He says, I want you to go and I want you to read this in front of the people. It may be. It may be that. And, and those four words, it's a single word in the Hebrew language. It means perhaps. It's an adverb which almost always expresses a hope. I want you to write it all down. I want you to read it. Perhaps. And I hope that the house of Judah will hear all the disaster that I intended to do to them so that everyone may turn from his evil way and that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. The message had been delivered over and over and over again. And one more time, God says, perhaps. Oh, I pray that this time they'll listen. God wanted to give his people, his wicked, rebellion, rebellious, and sinful people, yet one more opportunity to repent of their sin and to experience his forgiveness that they would avoid the disaster which was to come upon them. Even at this late date, God wanted to save them all. All that was necessary for them to be saved was that they would obey him, to acknowledge their sin, to repent of their sin, and to trust in him for deliverance. Well, why, after all this rejection of God over all these years, why wasn't he mad? Why wasn't he angry? Why couldn't he make the hammer drop just as quickly as possible? Why another opportunity? And simply this, because 
the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin for whoever asks. That's why God tells Jeremiah, write it down. Write it all down. Read it. And perhaps they may listen and obey and repent and be saved. Are you familiar with the doomsday clock? It's a clock that was developed after the, the first uh, atomic bomb was dropped on Japan, after it was, was developed by Albert Einstein and others. And in 1947, two years after the dropping of the bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, there was instituted a doomsday clock. And the purpose of the doomsday clock was, was to give mankind a, an idea of how close we were to absolute nuclear destruction. And, and so midnight being, you know, due day, <laughs> the doomsday. And so through the year, since 1947, every year in January, the clock is reset. In 1947, it was set at seven minutes to midnight, to give people an idea of how close we are to nuclear war. That was 1947, seven minutes till midnight. Since then, this clock has been set backwards, farther from midnight, eight times. And it has been set closer to midnight, 16 times. The farthest from midnight the clock has ever been set was 17 minutes till doomsday in 1991. And the nearest it has ever been set was 100 seconds, a minute and 40 seconds till midnight. And that's where we are today. In the days of King Jehoiakim, God's doomsday, doomsday clock for the fall of judgment upon his people was a mere seconds from doomsday. The, the dust cloud of the Babylonian armies was sweeping toward them and was growing larger on the horizon, and that dust cloud of war would soon envelop them. But even at this late date, it was not too late to turn to the living God. The urgency with which God held out his saving hand one last time is evidence of his love and his grace. And it's with that same love and urgency, God holds out his hand to each one of us and invites us and gives us one more opportunity to turn, to acknowledge our sin, our disobedience to him, and to repent of it and turn from it and to trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord. One day it will be too late. Your own personal doomsday clock will strike midnight and the opportunity of salvation will be passed. But it's not yet. It is not too late yet. That's why the Apostle Paul writes in, in 2 Corinthians, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. Don't turn a deaf ear to God today because it may well be your last opportunity. Jeremiah chapter 36 represents God's last call to repentance before judgment fell upon the repentance. This was the last call. This was the last opportunity they had to hear from the prophet of God and have their heart stirred and broken before him and repent of their sin and turn to him. God said, write it down because I want to give one more opportunity for people to respond. And so you have two models of obedience to God's word here in Jeremiah 36. And, and then you have, uh, uh, then we have one final opportunity to respond to God's word in obedience. The last thing, the last vantage point that we see of obedience in this chapter is a refusal to obey God's word. So God commands and Jeremiah obeys. He, along with his secretary, Jeremiah reciting in Baruch writing, 
they write down all the words God has given him to speak over the course of the previous 23 years. And once written, Baruch waits for an opportune time to go to the temple and to read aloud the words of God to the people. A fast day is chosen. A fast day when the thought would be that people would be a little bit more sensitive to spiritual matters than normally they would be. And so the day is chosen and the deed is done. Baruch's writing incites a chain of events in his reading of the word, incites a chain of events which finally leads to the winter home of King Jehoiakim. Some officials in the temple hear God's word, and one in particular named Micaiah, sought out a number of the king's officials who were at the palace. He told them what Baruch had read, and they told Jehudi to go and fetch the scroll so they could hear from themselves. So Baruch has spoken it. Micaiah has heard it. He tells others about it. They say, go get it. Bring Baruch and the scroll back to us. So Baruch and the scroll are brought to them, and he reads it for them. And their response When they heard all the words, they turned to one another in fear. Now, now we're not sure who they or what they were fearing. Hopefully, that they heard of the judgment of God coming, the opportunity to repent, and out of reverence and fear of God, they said they, they, they were filled with a holy awe before him. But it also could be that they were a fear, fearful of the king. If he hears it and he knows we didn't report it, then we could be in trouble. So, so we're not sure exactly what moved them. But they turned to one another in fear and they said to Baruch, we must report all these words to the king. Then out of concern for Baruch and Jeremiah, they told them to go and hide because the king ain't going to like this. They told the king about the scroll And they gave him an overview of what it said. Violence and judgment, terror on the other side. Then the king sent Jehudi to get the scroll. And he read it to the king and all the officials who stood beside the king. And it was in the winter months, so the king had a little fire pit by his chair to keep himself warm. Just like you have little fire pits on your patio or deck, uh, just to have a little fire in there, maybe roast a marshmallow or so. Well, he had a little fire pit beside his, his, his chairs to, to keep warm during the winter months. As Jehudi read three or four columns, the king would cut them off with a knife and throw them, I imagine he probably wild them up first and threw them into the pot. He would cut them off with a knife and throw them into the fire pot until the entire scroll, everything that Jeremiah had spoken and written down from the last 23 years had worked months and months. This wasn't an easy thing to do. Cut it off, roll it up. And the entire scroll was consumed in the fire that was in the fire pot. Yet, neither the king nor any of his servants who heard all these words was afraid. Nor did they tear their garments. No sorrow, no repentance. Obey? I'll never obey. We've heard the old saying, like father, like son. And there's often truth in it. But not always. When King Josiah heard God's word, his heart was broken by it, and he heeded it, and he obeyed it, and repented of his sin, and he was forgiven. When his son Jehoiakim heard God's word, his heart was not broken by it, but it was hardened to it. And you can almost hear the words of the poet flowing from King Jehoiakim's lips. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain 
of my soul. I'll never listen and obey. And so in disobedience to God and in rebellion against him, King Jehoiakim died. And Jeremiah tells us that no one wept. In fact, there, there was no royal funeral as befitting the head of state. He was given, according to Jeremiah, the burial of a donkey, a sign of God's judgment upon him. He was dragged and dumped beyond the gates of Jerusalem. He died under the judgment of the one whose word he never would obey. Jeremiah 36, we have two models of obedience to God's word. And, and we have spoken clearly to us another opportunity to respond in obedience to God and to his word. To turn from our sin and to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And in Jeremiah 36, we have the refusal of one to do that very thing. Jehoiakim. He burnt the scroll thinking he had put an end to all Jeremiah's nonsense. He thumbed his nose at God, and he thumbed his nose at God's word. And the scroll was gone. But, but God is not so easily silenced, is he? He told Jeremiah and Baruch, well, do it again. And praise God, they did it again, and we have the book of Jeremiah in our possession today because of their faithfulness and obedience to God. The very words of God, words that give life to all who hear and believe and obey and yield to him and turn by faith to Jesus Christ, that all who believe in him, all who believe in Jesus, will not perish as Jehoiakim did, but have eternal And so God's words to those like Jeremiah and Josiah, as the song says, are beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Words which offer pardon and peace to all who listen and yield and obey. And through the word of God, the written word, and most fully through the living word, Jesus Christ, the fullest expression of God's love for us. It is through him, through his sacrifice on Calvary, through believing that he died our death, that we might live, that we are saved. Oh, for the saved, for those who know Jesus, these words, they're beautiful words. And we're not going to throw them in the fire pot. We are going to heart or mind and heart and hold on to them and allow them to guide us each and every day because they are beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Would you stand as we sing that together?
words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. The Word of God, wonderful words. Beautiful words leading us to Jesus. I mean, that we not be like King Jeho Jehoiakim, who refused to get in step with them, respond to them. But maybe we be as those, and kind of among those who listen and who respond in faith and obedience. May that be how we position ourselves, both for time. And for eternity. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Go in peace. Amen.